Artist Anna Janik embraces watercolour in a spontaneous way that creates layers of washes with an emphasis on mark making. The works evoke fluidity and calm, yet also convey a dynamic rhythm and energy. Anna was born in Croatia and has double degrees, a Master of Fine Arts and Art Education from the Academy of Fine Arts, University of Zagreb. Anna has exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions with her work in private collections throughout Europe, the USA, Australia and Asia. She is represented by several well-known galleries and was recently chosen among 66 women artists out of thousands by Artsy's curatorial team for their women artists to watch list. Anna likes to draw a parallel between watercolour and life, commenting that it's unpredictable with only so much control over the outcome. Describing her process as a metaphor for the duality of life where certain things can be controlled while others happen spontaneously. A series of works with titles such as Flow Earth, Migration, Origin Cloud, Trail to Arcadia, Voyage and Flow take us through imaginary landscapes. Sometimes with the bird's eye view, sometimes a macro zoom. But whatever the viewpoint is, the washes flow, the marks can be bold, the scratches leap, dance and chat definitely taking us on a journey to someplace else, if only for a fleeting moment. Mark Walton from the Covert Collective says, the meticulous marks speak of long journeys past and reach out to our future selves to remind us that we have struggled before we have overcome those obstacles and can do it again. Anna has been living in the United States for the past 17 years and joins us today from the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. While in Sydney, Australia, we have Tara Axford, who we are thrilled to announce has officially joined the Fibre Arts Take Two team. You'll be seeing a lot more of Tara as she brings her unique creative perspective to our Friday Feature Artist interview series. So if you're joining in live, please leave a comment and let Anna and Tara know where you are in the world. And if you're catching up on a replay, we hope you enjoy this interview and feel compelled to share it with your friends. So without further ado, join Tara in welcoming our 57th Friday feature artist, Anna Janic. Well, hello, Anna. Thank you so hello, much for joining us today. And, uh, Thank you. Pressure. And uh, <laughs> certainly lots of people from all over the world since we've got this fabulous connection of time zones everywhere. So that's great. So as I welcome everybody, um, we've got Sally, Vicky, Kim, Julie, so many people. Um, I'll probably just uh, keep on with my questions. So let's dive in. Um, so we're going to embrace spontaneous. Uh, first sure. of all, mm -hmm. what, what led you to study art at university? Were your family creative and are they creative? Um, my family is very creative. <laughs> my mother was always an artistic soul and she wanted to actually pursue um, piano as, a, as her career. She wanted to be a pianist. Uh, her sister uh, was actually a professional uh, painter. And uh, I do have quite a lot of family and relatives that are professional artists on both my uh, father's and my mother's side of the family. Uh, my mom and dad um, have degrees in math. So I was not brought up in a house of artists, but I was always surrounded by uh, the relatives, you know, studios and talking about art and it was just always present in our life as something normal uh, and I think for me it's probably you know part of it is just genetics uh, since we do have like I, I I counted I think we have 12 uh, professional visual artists that have art degrees in our family and we're a, quite a small family so that's, that's a, a big, lot, big yes. number 
of artists. And, you know, some of them are uh, painters, some of them sculptors, some of them printmakers. Um, so I feel that for me, that was a very natural, organic path of, you know, becoming an artist. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. That's how and it I, was for me. I was... Mm -hmm. While I was doing research for this, I read that art is mandatory in Croatia. Is that true? It is. It, it is... It is um, <gasps> Uh, you know, we have eight years of elementary school, through, you know, through fr from the beginning, uh, you know, until the end of high school, you do have art. So in, in, in some form. Um, so in elementary school, you do have art as like a visual art class. And then you have music separately, but you always have those present in your education. And then in high school, usually it's art theory or more like art history, but most schools that I know of throughout the end of high school do have art. It's in, and it's, you know, it's not a class that you pick because you want to. You kind of usually just have it as mm. mandatory class. So, so that um, made me think, did that make it competitive? And also what happened to the sporty people? What did they do? <laughs> I'm not going to say that sports is not very popular in Croatia because it is, you know, our <laughs> soccer is very popular ski tennis, like a lot of, a lot of sportsy people there for sure. Uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know. We just have art and I think it's just, nobody really questions it. You know, you like it or don't like it, but it's just there. So for me, it was great because <laughs> I loved it. So yeah, and I noticed that you um, have a double degree and that you studied art education. So um, I was curious to know: Did you ever pursue a career in teaching, or was there? A I never. That, that was I, not I never. I never pursued a career in in painting. Um, so school system in in you know the United States and Croatia is quite different. So college, we don't. We, you know, once you pick your um, major you basically enroll in School of Art or, or you enroll in studying physics or you enroll studying math. So once you're in college, when, once you're in university, actually, um, you already are on a trajectory of becoming that specific thing, you know. So we don't uh, make choices after second year of whatever. It's, it's, it's very different. So once you enroll in university after high school, you already are choosing which one uh, it's going to be. So um, I enrolled in uh, um, art education program that actually uh, also has a lot of um, practical uh, studio art in, in you know, in, in uh, from portrait, like very technical and very uh, traditional. So throughout the entire education, you constantly have both art theory, art education classes, um, art history classes, and then studio art, which is takes up several hours a day, every single day in, in the studio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing from live model or, you know, doing once you're at the third and fourth year, you do get to have more of a freedom to express yourself, um, you know, choose what you want to do. But so uh, it is like a double major degree uh, that's as close as I can translate it to, um, you know, mm -hmm. U.S. standards. Um, so, so yeah, but you asked me about art education and if I ever pursued it. When I graduated, my husband and I moved to the States within several months after um, he graduated physics and I graduated from art school. Um, so that was one of the things, but the other thing is I think even if I stayed, I'm not sure if I would have pursued um, teaching because when I did teaching as part of practice in school, it, it always felt extremely um, engaging to me. And I feel that I was so um, engaged with the kids uh, that I probably would not be able to defocus from that, come home and then completely shut off and, and do my art. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not that type of person. So so for me, you know, I kind of uh, had this passion to pursue art as my career as a studio artist, you know. Yes. And um 
when we were chatting earlier in the week, uh, you mentioned that about uh, feeding your soul and that this you yeah. know, is important to you. And huh, well, the last two years have certainly been very testing. So uh, how did yeah. you manage to keep feeding your soul during this time? I feel that one of the, the um, interesting aspects of my personality is that whenever the going gets tough, I, I, am, I work good, well under pressure, actually, you know. So if there's no pressure, I'm okay. But usually I notice that when there is pressure, that makes me really going. Um, so, yeah, when the pandemic started, I have two kids. One is um, six years old. One is going to be 12 next week. Um, and they both, you know, like everyone here, I'm not the only one. We're all, we were all on the same, in the same boat. Um, the kids, the school switched to online learning. So they were at home, you know, my husband worked from home. I was at home. They were all at home and, you know, we were just plugging, unplugging and switching from one meeting to another. And it was, it was challenging, especially since my younger one was just started kindergarten. So he, you know, that was his beginning of, um, connection with school as a system. So I was very present all the time in their, in his especially life, meetings in school. Um, and that kind of made me um, push myself, wake up every day very early. I would usually go run, I would usually go jogging every morning <laughs> first. And then I started doing um, these small sketchbooks with lots of marks and lots of mark making that, um, I was able to do throughout the day. So what I would do is I would lay the very light watercolor wash in the morning on a few pages. And then once the, the, you know, school started and I was very close by, I would grab a pencil. And so I didn't need any complicated tools. I didn't need any setup. I could go from one room to another, or even if we had breaks and went outside outdoors, I could just carry this with me. So I simplified mm -hmm. the process. I always, you know, when things are complicated, I always, that's what I do. And that's what I would, if anybody asked me, suggest is to always simplify, always simplify, always go to, you know, the basics and to what feels good. Mm -hmm. That's my. And I've approach. just got a couple of close ups of those. So I'll just bring those up oh. now. That looks much oh, better <laughs> than my <laughs> video. Yeah. Beautiful, Max. Yes. And I'll just <clears throat> bring up those. And I notice in a couple of those, um, you have those burn marks how how did mm -hmm. those come about that's a that's a, a a funny interesting story actually so i always like to embrace things that happen kind of spontaneously you know i, I like to play mm -hmm. i like to see art uh, my art uh in a way as a play that's very important to me because i feel my work is soothing for me and it relaxes me and it makes me happy and it's always important to me for it to be spontaneous so um the burn marks happened in a funny way i was doing i was working on my migration series a couple of years ago and that actually they were all on wooden panels and i started since i do always have this interesting rusty uh burnt umber um, watercolor paint that I almost always have in, in all my work. I don't know why, but I love grounding the work with those rusty tones. Um, and I wanted to add another component to the wood um, by burning it a little bit. So I was using the torch to burn, to just burn it, you know, in some use accents a little bit with burned marks as well. And then my the son actually was playing with uh, the neighbor uh, and they started playing with a big magnifying glass and they were burning paper. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> they were playing with a magnifying glass and uh, and they were, and, and so I said to Albert, uh, to my older one, I said, 
why don't you why don't you you know use my watercolor paper just to see what kind of mark it's gonna make and it made this fabulous mark that was just like the water the burnt umber that I use anyways and I was just like this is beautiful I love this I love <laughs> this this is so much fun and then I remembered my dad actually did the same with us when we were kids he you know he showed me he was like I'm gonna show you something and I, this you know it brought back memories. And so I decided I'm going to embrace it because I spend a lot of time outdoors. You know, my kids, when they would be playing yeah. during the pandemic, I was kind of hovering over them and making sure, you know, <laughs> social distancing. <laughs> Maybe with a but, hose and, and buckets of water as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. With a hose and bucket of water. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so then I did, you know, I did a lot of that um, burning and it's all it's all with a magnifying glass you know it's not wow. it's not controlled Amazing. it's you know it's yeah. not lighter or torch anymore all of those are just magnifying mm -hmm. glass and sunlight and and for me I don't know that was just beautiful I love mm -hmm. nature I love nature and I love you know feeling that I'm connected with nature so that was so one thing I was curious to ask, I mean, I to just be in front of your uh, work must be amazing just to have those washes. They're just so, um, in, you know, engaging. But I was thinking, you know, often watercolour is seen as quite a methodical structural medium. How did you uh, like find your way into that sort of organic, spontaneous approach? Mm. Um, because normally there's so many rules around watercolours. Yeah. I, Did I you just go to a class like, and go, no, I'm not doing that, or you just threw some water and just... <laughs> No, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I, I did watercolor when I was very little. My mom, since her sister was a painter, my mom would set up a little, you know, um, watercolor area on our kitchen table. So I was used to painting with watercolors. And it was never any kind of structured uh, class. Nobody ever, when I was a child, taught me anything. I never took any classes. So it was just about play and being spontaneous. Um, when I was about to enroll in art school, I went to my father's aunt, who was an amazing uh, painter, amazing, amazing painter, and Katarina Janic. And she actually, since I had to make a portfolio of work that was also representative, um, she kind of taught me some, you know, elements of um, technique of watercolor. And I just remember coming to her house and she made this little, you know, um, composition of very simple things like a vase or something. And she said, and she gave me very limited palette of watercolors and a and quite a wide brush, you know, not, not, I mean, not, not as wide as this, which I love to use now, but you know, a wide brush that I thought, how on earth am I going to do anything with this? You know, like there, what, how do I do details? And so I just remember that she said, no, you don't want any details. You just want to, you know, be very loose and just, you know, kind of relax, you know, <laughs> and that was yes. her approach. Yes. So it was, again, not methodical and all her work, she was a representative painter, but it was all about her kind of dreams and moods and uh, portraits of relatives and, and, she always did everything in this kind of evocative way. It was always mm. like very mm. blurry, always very foggy. Uh, it was all about atmosphere. It was all about emotion. So that's kind of when she showed me how you can do watercolor and it could look really representational, very good and, and just amazing, uh, but still be very loose, very loose about it. You know, use a lot of water and just do things quickly and make quick decisions. And I just loved that. I remember, you know, yeah. like I loved the sense that something can be made quickly in a very improvisational way and you see the results fast and it was just fresh. Mm -hmm. So so mm -hmm. I, I just remember throughout my education, throughout art, art school that I would enjoy it very much and I would get feedback from my mentors and my uh, friends and colleagues. Um, but I feel watercolor is becoming very popular nowadays. And it was, I thought it was, I, I'm pretty sure it was quite uh, different 20 years mm -hmm. ago. You know, it was almost like a mm -hmm. forgotten 
um, technique, um, so or medium. Absolutely. So, yeah. Now, I've just remembered here that it's actually not just you and I talking. You know, I'm really loving this, but we've got all these people joining us as well. Yes. So I'm just going to... Yeah show you some of the comments um vicky says she the, loved the burnt yes holes. loving the burnt holes yum um, <laughs> rust absolutely mm. gorgeous thanks mia yeah it's uh, not actually rust. i might stories <laughs> yeah yeah uh so yes yeah, so everyone's plenty of people joining mm. us and loving the input so oh last one again what was that maybe the i am going to go back to those pictures again we've got the uh sorry the migration series me just learning to drive mm -hmm. the system hang there mm -hmm. um yes and we're going to talk about the migration one again in a minute but mm -hmm. um i also just wanted to ask we were talking about um the spontaneous and i was interested in the physicality so i've seen a video of you seated making the small marks but i was just mm -hmm. wondering uh Yes, do you move your body outside of your studio? So like, uh, you know, gym or running or whatever. And when you do the more gestural marks, are you still seated or do you stand? Uh, so I know I've thrown in a lot of questions, but basically what I'm oh, asking okay. is what is the oh, thoughts okay. on mind, body and art and how they're connected? Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. how, what does that mean to you? To me, I always love doing work standing I love moving I'm not comfortable sitting for a long time it's just not you know physically I'm not comfortable sitting for a long time and I'm an antsy person <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I do not like to be still so um for me you know the water and manipulating the paper and moving it obviously I always do that standing I do that always standing and then the mark making can be standing or sitting. It can, you know, if if I'm doing something very quietly or outside, I could be sitting. But oftentimes I will also stand and preferably, you know, in different parts of my studio or even different par parts of my house. Like, uh, you know, we have like a kitchen working area that is quite tall and I love standing there and doing the marks while I'm standing because it's just much more comfortable. So I do love the physicality. I don't like to be stationary. And I find it fun even, you know, when we travel, I started now um, whenever we visit, you know, family in Nashville. So it's like almost a nine hour trip uh, with the car to get there. Um, and I will, and I will literally even, you know, um bring my little my little fantastic uh, in the car so when my husband i'm not doing this while i'm driving like while i'm in the car <laughs> so th there's no doubt um but you know when my husband is driving and i'm i'm just um so he the, has to make sure he has a cruise control on and he's not hitting the speed humps in the potholes doesn't matter that that's part of the you know spontaneous of, I, I i i i'm sure some people are gonna be livid hearing this but it's really true i love embracing things that are very accidental and i don't think my work seems that way because there's a lot of you know there is still a lot of um composition like a structural uh, feel to it. It, it it is orchestrated in a way so it's not you know it's not like oh you know <laughs> paint just yes. spells better and that's it I do love playing with that balance of very very loose spontaneous and then very um introspective and quiet and just repetitive marks that are very that are slowing down mm. this mm. process you know mm. so and we will get to some of the uh, more spontaneous flowing ones, but just to go back to the migration. So um, I see that you became a U.S. citizen in 2019, um, and mm -hmm. I was going to just bring up your migration series. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about w were those two things connected, the, um, your citizenship and working on the migration series? They were absolutely connected. Um, they were connected in a way that I had this very, I, I have to say that, you know, I don't have preconceived 
plans when I when I create my work and I work in series so usually I will improvise and I'll be interested in you know specific palette and and I will experiment with certain set of colors and then a, a new body of work a new series will be born that way and then I will just do variations on a theme for a while so with this series I really kind of maybe even did something different in terms of deciding make a dis make, making a decision that i wanted to um make some kind of note of the fact that we that i became a, a citizen because it was a very long process and i was thinking about and you know when i just moved to the states i was i think 26 and um it was a cultural shock but i thought as you get older it gets easier uh, and then after many years, I realized it gets more complex because when you're a child, the first things you learn and you kind of like a sponge soak in, um, create you as a person. So your culture really does make a difference, whether you want it or not. It just it's a given thing. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, this interesting situation where we um, where my husband and I moved and it took us a long time to become citizens and um, what it really means and what are we and what you know what is nationality and and what does it mean to be both Croatian and American and, and all of those questions and then you know since I always use a lot of mark making in my work I uh, and people will often tell me, oh, this looks like birds flying or this looks like fish or this, you know, and I don't ever think, ha, ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I do get that a lot. And I really quite enjoy hearing when when I hear when I get feedback, feedback that my work in, evokes uh, a sense of music, like it, that it's very musical and lyrical. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so so I was thinking, okay, let's just embrace this sense of little marks and little, as my son would call them, ticks, uh, that mm. they're like in an abstracted way, maybe, you know, um, marks of birds or fish or yes, something yes. like that. And at, at that point when I was making that, it was a celebration of, it was a sense of, well, it's a natural thing, you know, people do migrate and birds migrate and fish migrate. And, you know, it's maybe complicated and hard for us as humans to, you know, change entire continents and, and move somewhere. It, it is. But, you know, it's an it's a natural process. So that series, when I made it, was not in any way negative or or nostalgic or um but I don't yes. know. <laughs> and uh, Lorna, I think this is a good point, that you're the conductor. Hmm. Really love the embracement of the spontaneous flow, but also a sense of how you're the conductor of this orchestral flow as these works evolve. I love That's being beautiful. the conductor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and know. also uh, Sally says, three years of watercolour classes in the 80s, like doing classical ballet classes. She got so bored. So she really needed oh, to hear this conversation. So. <laughs> yeah, no ballet. I did. I actually, um, I was enrolled in ballet as a child, and my approach. Oh. My, I mean, not approach. When you're five years old, there's no approach. My idea of what it would be it was, you know, pure freedom and just, you know, I'll, I would be glamorous. <laughs> and then I got a very strict teacher. It did not last long. I just said to my mom, "I'm not going there again. Like, don't. I'm no way. <laughs> I'm not doing yeah. this." Absolutely. So now instead of doing ballet, I'm doing Zumba and I'm having a lot of fun. Oh, yes, <laughs> me too. So this is Janice. So she does the same thing with an electronic wood burning tool. Yes. I don't know, Janice, do you have curly hair? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you okay, go. Okay, so some other questions. Um, Zoe says she'd like to know what adjustments you've made to working large with um, materials, planning versus spontaneity. And, uh, yeah, so could you talk to that a bit about uh, from your sketchbooks up to sort of full size? Yeah. So so I have to say that I normally, before pandemic, uh, I did not do sketchbook, sketchbooks at all. So this very small scale format is something that, 
started happening recently and it was just a practical way of um, still creating vi with limited, you know, um, means or limited time or circumstances. But, uh, you know, I usually, my most typical work ranges from 22 by 30 inches and I do not know anymore exactly what that would be in centimeters, uh, but... Mm, I think it's large. I it is it is it is large i mean it is it's like you see the pieces behind me yes like 26 by 40 inches so that is kind of like typical work that i do but then i do have some quite quite large work much much bigger that is you know taller than me um yeah. that is like 55 by 95 inches i do have quite a lot of work that is on that size. Yes. Uh, so in terms of the logistics for, for that, um, I had to decide how, like which way I'm going to go about because I do, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, 50 to 76 centimeters uh, is, is this, right? Yes, it's yes. sort of like just bigger than a ruler to kind of one of those really large rulers. Because <laughs> I'm like 55 by 95 inches that type that in because <laughs> that, that is big that is big um <laughs> I'm funny. well yes we'll get um, the, we'll get the background people to work that out <laughs> so so yeah it, it's still spontaneous my goal is always to be spontaneous so it's still spontaneous but preparation for it is mm. you know is is mm. you have to go to the basics and 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 kind of do a recreation how do I do this? How do I usually get this result? And how do I, you know, what do I do? So if I'm using, you know, a wide brush for this kind of work, now if you enlarge it to, you know, a few times the size, then you have to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and basically I do everything in the same way. I don't. I, I, I was always thinking about that. My marks are kind of controlled uh, they're very, yeah. very, um, they're both controlled and not controlled. And so I usually u use dip pen for that. So in a sense, they are yes. spontaneous. That's what Mia wanted to know. So yes. Yeah. So there you go. So I do use the dip pen, which is, you know, it does its own spontaneous thing. It's not highly controlled. It's not like, a, uh, you know, marker or whatever but it is very 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 fine it's very pointy and so it's not as loose as a twig would be you know twig would be much much more um expressive and unpredictable i think i i do love a little bit of control so it's somewhere you know it's a balance mm -hmm. i do feel yeah. I'm interested always in natural materials and trying it out, but um, it feels like a diff a little bit different, a different avenue. Mia, thanks. Thanks you for uh, showing the dip pen. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. Spinning with ideas. <laughs> I love that. Yes, it is. It is interesting that uh, just um, the pause of having to, because it's not continuous flow, is that you have to it's keep not, dipping it in. So I that's do. part of yes. the practice. Yeah. Yeah, and I do. I, was, I kind of, you know, yeah, like you hmm. said. I, do. I was wondering that too. Like if you're having a session where you're doing mark making and then life happens and you have to leave and come back, mm -hmm. is it mm -hmm. easy to reconnect with that flow That in both cases? Like is it easy to reconnect to the flow of that and is it easy to reconnect to the flow of that depending on when you have to stop and start something? It's an, in, it's an interesting balance and I just found my own way of, of this particular expression that, that I have in all my work is a mix of doing things very quickly and very spontaneously and deliberately and letting things happen. So I do, you know, after doing this for many, many years, decades, let's not go into that, but okay. Um, <laughs> I I know what I'm doing, you know, like I know what I'm doing. Yeah. If I needed to, you know, do a course, I would have to sit and write it down because I'm not think I'm doing it very spontaneously. It's like, you know, like driving a car. I, I no longer need to think what I'm going to do. Um, but 
there's usually part where it's watercolor wash or washes that is quite fast and man manipulating the paint quickly. And once that initial part is done, then I usually will come back and I will add maybe one more wash or two washes or, you know, or some accents somewhere. And then I will start adding marks. And then once I start adding the marks, I like to do a little bit and then let it sit and then come back. I, I like then to build and uh, give it time. Uh, so, so it is interesting because it is both very quick and like a deliberate decision that is very, very quick. And then it's more like reflective, like, you know, just reflecting uh, upon the, the work and, and reacting to what I made so far. Um, mm. And that's slow, that's, that is slow and, and kind of, um, I, I go and do whatever and then I come back and then I take, so I usually work on several pieces. I don't, it would be very hard for me to create one piece from beginning to end and then go to the next one. I, I usually don't do that. I usually create several pieces that are, have a same feel, have the same palette and do, you know, those, as you can see, I have, you know, like I have surfaces, I have this big uh, table and then this one here, and I like working on the floor too. So I usually have several pieces in the making. And the preparations for the sketchbooks. Um, so when you have the sketchbook work, do you then automatically scale that up for a larger piece or is it more just a stepping off point that they inspire, the smaller pieces inspire the larger pieces rather than a direct enlargement copy? I never do any enlargements. Uh, I never recreate anything that I do. Every single, you know, uh, piece that I make, whether it's a humongous piece or if it's, you know, this page, it's just that. There's no, there's no repetition in a literal sense. So it can be, um, you know, it, it can, this can inspire me. I, I might say, oh, you know, I really enjoyed these colors right now. That's always another thing. For me, I'm always just reacting to something that I'm drawn to in that moment. And, and then, you know, maybe I'm going to work with some completely different colors in a few days or months or years, mm. I'm not interested in um, anything that is very um, methodical or that is very permanent. I love for work to just flow all the time. So it can be a little reference, you know. So with sketchbooks, what happened is I really loved um, the feel of, you know, some of, the, some of those pages. I just enjoyed what they turned out to look like. And so... I started doing the same process on a little bit larger scale, and then I enlarged it, uh, the same method, I would say, enlarged on like 40 by 60 or so, which is also quite large, uh, but never putting something that I already made in front of me and looking and then trying to make a copy. I don't, I don't enjoy doing that. <laughs> Someone would like to know, do you have tubes of watercolor paint I don't think they come I in have tubes, never do yeah I don't think they do I have a lot of tubes <laughs> I have a big big amount of tubes from many many brands because I always love trying things out I love yes and love, that was something love. I was curious do you have um go-to brands or go-to colors and also I know that some artists don't actually like to work straight out of a tube so are you someone that likes to mix or do you have kind of your favorite go-to's I will say I'm I go with so many brands and so many um paints uh in terms of you know uh Diff like I will, I will, for instance, get Prussian blue. I'm just giving you an example. It can be anything, but let's say I'll just, you know, go with Prussian blue from all the, you know, Daniel Smith and, and um, Schminke and uh, Holbein. You know, I will just buy all kinds of Prussian blues and then I will try them out and some I will like very much and some I will like less. 
and then I will, so some of the uh, colors, if I like them very much, I will use them directly and that will just be, that. that's it. Uh, but I do a lot of mixing as well. For me, it's just a sense whether I like it or not. You know, it's not, it's not a chemistry for me. I, you know, I know I've worked with paint so much and for such a long time that I know what happens and what is transparent and which one is saturated and which one, you know, is, is not saturated and which one is more light fast. I know the theory, but I'm not interested in sitting and, you know, revising the theory. I'm just interested in improvisation. Yes. And I think we, um, to answer Mia's question, we were talking about um, if there is water near you in Chicago. I mean, you were talking about your love of nature. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, when I grew up, I grew up in, Cro I was born and I grew up in Croatia. Uh, my family and I, and I'm sure most people in Croatia, would uh, spend our summer vacations on the coast of uh, the Adriatic Sea. So that was a natural uh, default thing. So, so I spent a lot of time as a child um, just close to water and a lot of swimming, a lot of diving and, you know, observing the sea life, which I absolutely adored. Even, you know, uh, even though it, it's a natural thing in Croatia, I in particular really was drawn to it. And I even fantasized about becoming a professional diver or becoming a professional, you know, like a sea biologist. Really? I really was yeah. very drawn to that. Yes, always. That's even so now, interesting. I'm, yeah, yeah. That's yes. the scientific part, I guess. <laughs> and, and it's funny that you mentioned diving because I was, you know, trying to... Um, uh, when I was looking to describe your work, I was diving was a word that came to mind so much because you kind of want to dive into them or you feel like you're immersed in a particular environment. I, your, what your I loved about, yeah, I think I think what I loved about this feeling of being underwater too is not just the sense of water and like the clarity and the, uh, you know, the fish and the algae and whatnot. It's also uh, the sound when you're underwater the sound uh, that is very muffled and just everything quiets down and it's just extremely relaxing and everything that has to do with water. I, I think for most people, you know, just the sound of water is something very special and calming. Um, so, yeah, so that is, you know, one thing. Then we would go to Slovenia for, you know, for many of our um, holidays too, which to an area that is, you know, um, within Alps, and that has tons of gorgeous turquoise colored um, uh, creeks and waterfalls and lakes and fast mountain mountain rivers. Um, so I do feel that I, I was always connected with water in some way um, and always loved it. And, and I feel that colors in my work too, to some extent probably reflect that. Um, never in a conscious way where I am trying to recreate something. More like just, you know, what I find pleasing, what I find that feeds my soul when I'm creating the work. I feel that this is just right. Or, you know, I want to do this palette with greens and blues. But I don't think, you know, I'm not referencing a specific um, thing. Yes. Now, Mary Ellen says she loves your work and um, she'd like to hear who inspires your own as your work definitely inspires her and she thanks you. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, what are your inspirations? Do you have any particular artists or is it more do you get to go to galleries or nature or what inspires I would, you? I would say, and this might sound very unusual, I don't know, maybe it's not unusual, I almost feel a little bit uncomfortable saying it so openly, but... Um, I feel when I was younger, I had so many artists that inspired me and, and I do feel, you know, obviously there are so many amazing artists that you feel drawn to, you feel that they're like kindred spirits or whatever. Uh, but as I'm getting older and as an artist more mature, I think, I don't look out so much. Um, and I don't find inspiration in other art. I do like some, you know, artists work very much, but um, but I'm, 
I feel everything that I create really comes from in the inside, comes from uh, my experiences or my emotions, and more so with connected connection with nature. I I find than any kind of. Uh, I actually don't like going to museums, <laughs> I, you know, because for me, I feel that it's very hard to tune out the noise of um, mm, visitors and, and the commute to get there. And I know that a lot of artists and people in general would not understand this quite, but it is the way it is for me. I'm very, I'm a solitary uh, person and I like quiet and I feel it's extremely hard to um, feel the work very often it's very hard for me to experience it to experience it uh, when I'm in a museum unfortunately mm -hmm. <laughs> so... now I do want to ask uh, Teresa's question could you share something of your daily weekly routine do you ever suffer from procrastination or do you have a daily creative habit to keep you focused on this solo adventure of yours <laughs> i think i i always crave for routine i feel like if i had i always feel that my routine uh if it was more predictable if it was a routine if it was if there was more structure to it that I would be uh, happier uh, with the way I'm doing things but actually the truth is I don't think there is a big routine in in my work I think I still especially you know now being a parent to two kids that are still fairly young I feel that I'm always uh, balancing and for me, being a parent is, you know, that it can't come as a um, as a second thing. It's 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 all, you know, my work and my life and my kids. It's all just one thing. It's not, you know, I don't, I can't really separate those things. So uh, it's hard to have a routine. I think maybe, you know. Creating a routine in a in a deliberate way, I'm afraid that it probably would not work very well with my kind of work. Uh, yes. I do like to react to to things. I like to I like my mood to take me places, and you know, and that some some days I will create work that will be in very vivid hues, and I will pick one of my series mm. that has bright colors and. If I'm in a different mood, I will, you know, so I do love that it's reactive um, and, and, mm. and, and I just uh, do my work when, I, when I'm uh, able to do it and I don't do it when I'm not able to do it. And sometimes I'm unhappy because I do have the urge to create, but it's just not the right time. Like my kids are just mm. coming from uh, school and they need to be fed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um and we are kind of running out of time. I just wanted to ask a couple of things. So um, this idea of feelings and expression, and I was curious about um, are these feelings and thoughts both in Croatian and English or one or the other, and then when you have something like this, um, your um. Lush Nebula image, the, the titles are so also evocative. Um, yeah, how... Do, do you kind of also uh, keep notes of the feelings or do they automatically just become the works? I think they become the works, uh, absolutely. And in terms of thinking, uh, in, if you ask me in, in which language I'm thinking, I'm not sure if, if that's what you asked me. Uh, but even if you didn't ask me, that's an interesting question. <laughs> and I do think always in Croatian. I always think in Croatian. So I'm always, now I'm translating all my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm doing yeah. hard work. Uh, yeah, I'm always thinking in Croatian and I'm a little bit nostalgic because I know that I will never be able to express myself in English the way I can express myself in, oh, in Croatian. That's language, so you know, interesting. Cause, yeah. Because as someone you know, who can only speak, as someone who can only speak one language, I've always just, assumed that English must be so limiting because other languages oh. seem automatically so expressive. Oh, um, English is fabulous and so complicated and has so many layers and so many ways of 
saying things and it's just unfortunate that you know um I'm not sure if one lifetime is enough when you start learning it uh, and using it every day uh, as an adult, you know, switching from one language to another. But but I am sure that uh, I can express more nuanced feelings and um, emotions and thoughts uh, directly, of course, in my native language, because those thoughts are automatically generated and translation, you just, there's always something that's lost in translation let's put it that way yes so, yes so true. yeah yeah okay now back to a couple of uh, technical questions uh philippa would like to know do you use rough or fine-grained paper and which do you prefer and why uh-huh i use both i would even say go one step you know further and say i use all kinds of watercolor paper that i can get my hands on uh, I love the hot pressed paper. If I had to choose, I would say that is the paper that I love the most because it leaves these beautifully crystallized um, shapes and the dip pen in particular glides over it so easily. There's no resistance. I don't like resistance. Um, but, but <laughs> and so are you working straight on the paper or do you need to prepare it? I never prepare anything. I just grab a piece of paper and just grab and start. Go. Yeah, I don't do any, I don't, you know, tape the work. I don't, I have my own devices, you know, by now I have kind of figured out things that work for me and the type of work that I do. So I will do things like if I don't want it to be, uh, for paper to warp too much, I will, when it's drying, put, you know, books around the edges and, you know, little things like that, that basically every artist has to discover your own, you know, you have to find your own um, method, I would, I would say. And it, yes. you know, it, it has to work for your particular kind of work. Um, yes, Julie would like to know whether you use um, media other than watercolor and graphite pencil. And I, I actually, did we ask no. about ink? You you not you don't the marks are made all with watercolor or they're not? Yes, actually. So so it is watercolor. Um, oh, some watercolors do come in in bottled form where it's already prepared and liquid. But uh, but but I still use only watercolor. So there are you know India ink and there's uh, different kinds of or acrylic. Uh, you know, different kinds of inks. I do not use ink at all. I just mm. use watercolor. So the only thing that, and I do started using graphite for mark making, though mark making is usually just watercolor with dip pen. Uh, so it's usually sepia, you know, burnt umber, like dark tones for, for the marks or black, uh, but it's still watercolor. Very wood, if painting on yes, the wood. Yes, do you paint directly onto the wood panel? I do. Um, I do. I absolutely do. And I did get that question, you know, many times, uh, what if the acidity of wood alters the uh, painting? Uh, it, then yeah. it alters the painting, you know, mm. I don't care. We need to and, uh, more crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I that agree. Is fun. Uh, <laughs> now, we were just going to... Uh, in your recent solo show, um, you also included some ceramics, but uh, in our earlier chat this week, you mentioned that um, they are not for sale. So I've got an image here of one of your mm. ceramic pieces. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about um, your ceramic mm -hmm. work and how that came about? Mm -hmm. uh, so my ceramic work came about when my first son, and I'm just going to show you one of those just so that, you know, the viewers get the idea of the scale. So this is one that is maybe on the bigger side. So usually it's mm -hmm. a little bit smaller than this and some are like the, even the size of this inner circle. So quite small um, and they're quite flat too. You know, they're like, like almost like plates. Um, so the way I started creating those is when my, my first one was born and I was at home 
um, most of the time with him and it was it was very difficult time for me because I was you know first time mom and I did not have any knowledge of this experience uh, before and since um, I did not have my family here or any relatives and I didn't have many friends or anyone that would be um, support in a way like a nanny or anything like that mm. I felt that I needed um, an outlet so when my husband would come back from work that I could do something that was completely removed and outside the house and not connected to anything that's um, um, where I need to be a mom. I felt that um, the change from not being a mom all my life to becoming a parent was extremely difficult for me. I felt that uh, I was no longer free, you know, because I felt um, and not that I felt this is the way it is. You know, I had this little child that cannot that cannot exist without constant uh, mm. help. So you cannot switch off and say, OK, now, you know, I'm bored. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> this, this is forever. So mm -hmm. I understood that I needed to find some outlets that would keep me sane because it was very difficult. And so I started actually going out to a pottery um, studio where I was where I started very slowly making these little plates very small very intimate uh, very simple uh, way of ex expression but it was also you know uh, sense of the clay and the feeling of soil and feeling of just being very grounded and doing something that you know I was never meant to be um, produced large scale or to be anything else than just that and I found myself repeating and making many, many, many of those uh, pieces. And they started becoming, you know, like a, this almost like a big installation where I would have a lot of uh, those pieces. And it actually reminded me when I was a child, when I visited my grandparents' house, uh, there was an old potter who lived a few houses from my grandparents' house. Uh, who was a who was a potter, and he had his entire front yard covered in uh, functional, beautiful functional pottery that was unglazed, and that was you know different forms, but very simple, and and they looked like a gathering of almost different personalities. Oh, you know, wow. it was just mm, amazing. Mm. So whenever I would go and visit my grandparents as a child, like very very little child, my grandma would have to take me to to him and and we would always ask for a little bit of clay so that was one of the memories that I have um, as playing with clay as a child very early on so I, I think when I was doing this it was just the sense of doing something that was very soothing and grounding and very natural mm. um, it sounds me. like almost um, each piece of the uh, ceramic represented people that may have been there at some time, which leads me to yeah. something I wanted to know about your mm -hmm. um, the idea of the mark making and uh, the symbolism and uh, this sort of visual language. Mm -hmm. At some point, do the symbols mean something or are they meant to be ambiguous or it's more your personal visual language rather than at, der derived from an actual symbol or language i think i think uh, i always loved i always loved little marks even when i was just doodling as a kid i always loved the detail and now when i sometimes go to some of the you know little drawings that i made as a kid with dragons or whatever it's always very very detailed so i always just had that as as a part of my uh, personality i think this interest in in um, contrast between something that is very uh, soft and 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 light and then the energy that is you know almost like this quiet quiet angst inside <laughs> that needs to be released I'm very drawn to that and I think over the years especially since I you know came to a different culture I'm very drawn to this idea that the work is universal and that it might almost resemble when you're looking from a distance of some kind of um, calligraphic note or writing. So you might even assume sometimes with some of my series that something is written and then you come closer and it's just like marks. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm drawn, I'm drawn to this idea that there is some kind of language, but the language is not a specific language of a specific country, of a specific nation mm. and written in mm. specific lettering, but it's just the language of, of visual um, expression. Mm. So in a way, it's more so I, inclusive and broad, broad reaching. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Beautiful. So I do enjoy that idea. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, can you believe that has already been an hour? I mean, <laughs> I could talk about a lot. <laughs> process and flow forever. Um, but, yes, I'm conscious of your time, your family, your children, and my cat is hovering mm -hmm. around here as well. <laughs> um, so we probably mm -hmm. should look at finishing up. And thank you so much to everybody from around the world that mm -hmm. has joined us. And if you can start popping your comments of thanks to Anna for joining us into the thank um, you, the below that it'd be great and so I just I mean what's coming up for the next 12 months and what are you looking forward to for the next 12 months um the first thing that I know is coming up is a show that I will be doing uh, with my Denver gallery Walker Fine Art that uh, is going to be themed around water uh, so I am going to be one of I believe four or five artists. It's a huge space. So usually Walker Fine Arts does, uh, not usually, they always do group shows. They don't do solo shows because of the space uh, size. So I'm going to be making some really large scale uh, work that is from my reef series that is also inspired by water and sea. And um, the palette is gonna be greens and turquoise and uh, variations of blues so that is the first thing that's coming up that's beginning that's uh, somewhere beginning uh, slash middle of may and uh, in september i'm going to uh, be um, exhibiting at a uh, local university aurora university that is quite close to my home that i've been invited to um, to have a show there uh it's going to be a two artist show and so it's in a stage where you know we're um, since it's just two artists uh we are uh, doing a lot of brainstorming how you know the logistics of of uh just mm -hmm. having uh that it's a, it's a major i would say show that that that, that one in, in september since it's like a museum setting Fantastic. so i'm very excited about uh, those two and then you know just creating that never stops <laughs> that is always yes. just happening regardless <laughs> regardless of the shows or no shows and be sure to let us know mm -hmm. if you ever do make it to Australia we've got lots of water in oh my goodness. for you as well <laughs> yes I, that's that's in the works for someday <laughs> hopefully <laughs> excellent well thank well, you so much of Thank you. Yes, so stay on the line. And thank you so much for taking time to be our Friday feature artist. It's been absolutely wonderful and I'm sure everyone's loved it. If you hang on here for a little minute, we'll play a slideshow and I'll pop up the comments of thanks. So thanks again, thank Anna. It's been amazing. And happy nearly weekend to everybody. And, okay, let's see how I go here with my controls. Oops. Slideshow happening soon.